Hey, Crossbridge family, welcome again to another church online service. We're so happy you're here joining us. Listen, if you haven't gotten connected yet, we'd love to have you go to our website. On there, you'll find the connect card button. Fill that out. You can put in your prayer requests there. You can find out ways to serve on a serve team within your church, or you can get to know more about the church through that form. Will you join us as we pray for today's service? Lord God, we thank you so much for another opportunity for us to gather together, um, for us to hear your word and sing songs of praise. We pray that you would put your hand over this service, that this service would speak to everyone who hears it, God, that you would move in our hearts, move in our souls. God, we love you and we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's worship together. Desires, 
that are honoring and pleasing to you. And so as we sing this to you, Father, we ask that you would act. Church, pray this with your heart. Come awaken your people. Come awaken the city. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. Hear the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out. Sing that again. Come awaken. Come awaken your people. Come awaken the city. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. Hear the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. The darkest night, you can light it up. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. Hallelujah. Hear the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. One more time we sing because there's no prison. Because there's no prison wall you can't break through. No mountain you can't move. All things are possible. Because there's no broken body you can't raise. No soul that you can't save. All things are possible. Things are possible. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my.
Church, he's worthy. God bless you all. You may be seated. As we move to the time of giving, I want to share with us a verse from 2 Corinthians 9. It says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. Whenever I hear this word, it reminds me of my grandma, who was the pillar and the matriarch of faith in our family. I still remember every Monday, she would go to the local bank and ask teller to exchange her money with the brand new bills, crisp and clean. And she would take them and stick them in between her Bible pages to prevent it from wrinkling or crumpling. That was how she prepared for her Sunday worship. And ever so cheerfully, on every Sunday, she would gather them and put them in an envelope and go to church. This was how she prepared for her worship. No matter what the amount that she could bring, it was a never an afterthought. And because she prepared, she was able to give cheerfully. And I am sure that God had received all of her offering because of her heart, the heart of stewardship. And that is what we're offering our Crossbridge family right now. Uh, your stewardship, your prepared heart to be a cheerful giver. And when we bring all this stewardship together, it creates these wonderful invitations. What invitation, you ask? 
One of them is the invitation to our all-campus baptism. What started out as a desire, a vision, wanting to see 100 converts in this year, already produced many baptisms in February, and now we are getting ready for our second all-campus baptism this coming Saturday at Kibis Gang Campus. Another invitation is a celebration together for the launch of a brand new Homestead campus. Many of you guys know that our very own Pastor Marcus has went to Homestead and started the relaunch process last year, and they are so excited to celebrate this launch Sunday with all of our family, Crossbridge family together this coming Sunday. All these because of your generosity and your stewardship. So thank you. And I want to ask you to keep pressing on because these will create much needed help and help us to do the ministry in this city throughout his kingdom. There are three ways that you can participate in giving you all of your treasures, online, app, and also via mail. Whichever way that you choose, may your extreme generosity and your stewardship go forth and bless those around us. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all the blessing that you have granted us. Lord, we bring back a small token of what you have given, but Lord, will you bless it that it may have 30, 60, 100-fold harvest. Lord, bless us to be the source of blessing for many around us. Thank you so much for who you are and whose we are. Pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hey church, welcome to episode six of our series, Love Works, and today we're looking at how love works in marriage. But before we jump into the text, we're going to hear a story, a life story, from a couple at our Crossbridge Pinecrest campus. We're going to see God's goodness in their life and marriage, and we're going to see God's grace to them. And I pray that this story encourages you, and I pray that it prepares you to hear God's word about his design for marriage. Hello, we are John and Lisa DeRosimo. We're grateful to share our love story with you. Lisa and I met in medical school. During our first, no, this isn't a date, date, we were listening to live music and eating dessert at a jazz club in Pittsburgh. Our dessert was a cake from the bakery across the street. It was really good. Lisa said that this was the cake she's having at her wedding. I still tease her that she said, our wedding. We dated for about two years. I proposed to Lisa while visiting her in Paris. We were the same age, heritage, career path, and had similar dreams. We had even done the premarital training with our pastor. What could possibly go wrong? The fairy tale lasted for a few years. We were in love, but then the stressors came and we had trouble getting our married life together. John worked long hours and often had to stay overnight in the hospital as a surgery resident. As new parents of a baby girl, time alone was often a challenge. Besides, we were both exhausted. I was married, but so alone. I grew very bitter. 
My training finished and I started looking for a position. The best offer was in Charleston, South Carolina. We agreed that I would take the job in Charleston. Lisa said she was moving to Florida. I had started work in West Palm Beach. I had already delayed my medical career to start our family. I had worked hard to become a physician as well. I had career dreams too. Besides, my whole family was there in Florida. I didn't want to live in Charleston. Lisa commuted back and forth to Florida. The time away from me grew longer and she was only home for a few days every four to six weeks. I was married on paper, but alone. We tried multiple marital counselors without success. There was nothing about love, sacrifice, respect, or God's design in any of the sessions. Then the final argument happened. We argued about where to live, future children, money, and our families. Regrettable things were said on both sides. I realized I had reached the breaking point in our marriage. I had given Lisa my heart and she crushed it. So I turned off the light switch of love. I told her that I wanted a divorce and I filed the papers for dissolution. After several months of legal paperwork, I realized I could not fix the marriage my way. I had to take the log from my eye. I thought I had been doing my part as John's wife. However, my long absences kept me from being the suitable helper that God had intended. Every time I left Charleston, I placed my desires above my husband. Seven months later, everything was finalized. All I needed to do was sign the divorce papers. Instead, I took my biggest step of faith. I sold my practice in Florida and moved to Charleston. I was completely alone in this decision, but God gave me a spiritual family of strong, godly women who taught me to respect my husband and lead a spirit-filled life. When Lisa moved back to Charleston, I realized that she was a different person. After another year of living separately, I calmed down enough to accept her submission and attempt reconciliation, and God blessed us with our second daughter. Around this time, we started doing biblical counseling. This was the true catalyst to reconciliation of our marriage. We opened the Bible to find solutions to our marital problems. Our marriage was transformed by the Word of God. Then a great job opportunity came up in Miami. Lisa had previously told me that she was never moving to Charleston, and I had told her that I was never moving to South Florida. God proved that he has a great sense of humor. Ten years ago, I moved to Miami. Lisa came with me as my wife. We continued our biblical counseling, and my heart started to soften. I was finally willing to submit myself to God who guided me with love, grace, and forgiveness. I chose to forgive Lisa and accepted her forgiveness of me. I learned that love is not an emotion. Love is a decision that you make in your mind and in your heart every day. Love is an action that you practice every day. We are here together as man and wife, only by the grace of God. God used the flames of that trial to refine our love for Him and for each other. We've been married for nearly 25 years now, and our relationship is sweeter than it could have been without the test of our faith and love. God graciously wrote our love story in a way that neither of us could ever ask or imagine. We pray that sharing our story will bring glory to God and demonstrate that all things are possible through Christ who gives us strength. Hey church, welcome to episode six of our series, Love Works. And today we are looking at how love works in marriage. How love works in marriage. Now one thing I want to say from the very beginning is that marriage is not a strategy or a survival tactic to combat loneliness. In fact, marriage is also not a social construct. Rather, it has been set by God from the very beginning of history and the very beginning of time. God's idea for us and for our flourishing is to be together in a marriage union between a husband and a wife. And we see that in the very beginning of Scripture. In Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, we read about God as the creator creating everything. The entire universe, the stars, the earth, 
water, light and darkness, trees, plants, fish, the animals on the land, birds in the sky, and Adam, the first man. Now here's what's so interesting. We read that God creates everything and that it's good. But yet, God being all-knowing and very purposeful, he leaves something out of his creation. It says that as, as God creates everything, that he sees that it is not good for a man to be alone. That Adam is not meant to be alone. And Adam feels that tension too. And God knows what he's doing. He's being strategic here. And so as that desire is made known to Adam that it's not good for him to be alone, that he needs a companion, he needs somebody by his side, God, knowing the remedy is only going to be his wife, Eve, God does not bring her immediately. Isn't that interesting? God knows that what Adam needs is Eve, but he does not bring her right away. Rather, what happens is that God begins to bring the animals, it says, of every kind, male and female, to Adam for him to name them and for them to possibly be a suitable companion for him. Now, if you have pets, you know that animals can be great companions. Your dog, your cat, a fish, a hamster, that all types of animals, and there's a relationship that can be developed between humans and animals. There's that connection to God's creation that provides a level of companionship, but it doesn't suffice. It isn't the type of companionship that we really crave deep down. And so God is doing something in, in Adam, in his heart, as he brings these animals of every kind, and it says, of every kind, meaning male and female. So you've got to picture what's going on with Adam. He's sitting there feeling this desire for companionship, and he's naming these animals, which had to have taken a long time. And they're coming two by two, male and female. And at the time, Adam has no counterpart. And it isn't until after it is made known to Adam, after he's named all the animals and it's been this long period of time, that he realizes these will not suffice. And so God then puts Adam to sleep. And out of his side, he fashions a suitable companion, a suitable helper for Adam, which is his wife Eve. And when he wakes up from his sleep and he sees Eve before him, he erupts into the first poem in the history of the world. He says, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He sees his wife and he is head over heels for her. He, he has found that companion, that desire that was cultivated within his heart that God took time to fill. He finally sees it fulfilled in Eve and he erupts into poetry. So what's God doing? See, God here, knowing that he's going to create everything good, is still working in Adam's heart and cultivating in him this desire for his bride so that when he sees Eve, he will see the goodness of her. He will see God's love and his grace in providing Eve for him. He will understand the importance of this union this marriage. This is what God's designed from the very beginning. And so I want to say this as we jump into the text here tonight in Ephesians chapter 5. What my prayer is for you. My prayer is for you that if you are married, that as we read through this together and as we see God's design for your marriage as a husband, as a wife, and overall as being a uh, an example of Christ in the church and as a picture of oneness and an experience of oneness that you would view your spouse as God's grace to you. That you will look back on God's perfect timing to bring them to you. That you would be challenged but you would also look at your marriage afresh. Maybe there would be some poetry in your home. And if you are eagerly anticipating a future marriage, that maybe tonight, God would, or today, God would give you a vision for that marriage 
of the person that God in his perfect timing will bring. And maybe today, if you have had a failed marriage, that you will see God's love and his grace to you and how he's working for your good even now. And that you will feel some freedom and forgiveness and you'll be able to move forward to see what God may provide for you in the future. So that's my prayer. As we interact with God's text, that we will see the beauty of marriage that was set by God and that we will stand anew in the relationship that we have or the relationship that God may provide in the future. And so I want to say this as we jump into the text in Ephesians chapter 5, because this would be kind of uh, the metaphor that I'm going to be using throughout this text, and that, and that is this, that marriage is like a wheel. And I think that this is what we see here in Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Ephesus, that marriage is like a wheel, that it is meant to have forward momentum, and that in order for a marriage to function properly, Both sides that are attached to the wheel need to be pushing together because only when both sides are pushing can you actually gain the speed necessary to move over the cracks and roadblocks that come. Now, if if you ride bikes or if you ride a skateboard or really anything with wheels, you know that, for instance, I'll use my phone, if you're going slow and you hit a bump, you stop. Or maybe if sometimes you crash, you hit a crack or a bump and you're going too slow, you can't go over it. But if you have enough speed and you hit a bump, you can go right over it much easier. Oftentimes, you actually barely feel cracks and bumps if you have enough speed. And what I think we will see tonight is that God's set and ordained marriage, which is a picture of oneness and is beautiful, is that when we function within the responsibility that has been given to us as husbands or wives, that it actually begins to build the necessary momentum in our marriages so that we may grow, so that we may move past some of the adversity, some of the bumps and the cracks that we will inevitably find as we move forward together in marriage, in union. And so we're going to interact with that tonight. And the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, as I mentioned, He speaks about the role of a man and a woman in marriage. And he says this in verse 22 through 24. And I think what he's saying here is, here's how you get the wheel moving. Here's how you get that momentum building as wives and as a husband. He starts with the wives first. He says this in verse 22 through 24. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Here we go. He says, wives, submit to your husbands. Wives, submit to your husbands. Now, when you read that, many of you are immediately triggered. I have your attention. If I didn't have your attention before, I have your attention now because the Apostle Paul just said that wives are to submit to your husbands. What is he saying? Is he saying that women are somehow inferior to men? Is he saying that men are meant to have authority over women? Or that the role of a wife is somehow less than the role of a husband? What does he mean when he says wives Submit to your husbands. Well, it's important to understand what the widely held belief around marriage was during the time period that the Apostle Paul writes. And certainly the widely held position and belief on marriage in Ephesus. So, most of the idea around marriage was formed from a Greek philosopher named Plutarch. Plutarch said this about marriage between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. He said that husbands, you are to rule over your wife, you are to control your wife, and wives, you are not meant to seek to control your husband in any way. In fact, you are to obey your husband. Don't shoot the messenger. Okay, This is Plutarch. He then says that 
Husbands or men, you are the soul of that relationship. You are the soul, in fact, he says, of humanity. Which, what he means is, you are the intellectual, rational, really the essence of what it means to be human. And then he says, wives or women, you are the body. You are the material aspect. And together you make one whole person. The body, the material, and the soul, the rational, intellectual essence. And I think what the Apostle Paul is actually doing here is he's combating Plutarch. He's combating the widely held belief around marriage and the role of a husband and the role of a wife. Because you have to understand what he says here. He says, wives, submit to your husbands. He doesn't say, wives, Obey your husbands, which would have been the common understanding. And we're going to get to what he says about husbands, which looks very different than control your, your wife. And we're also going to see that he doesn't view the wife as the body and the husband as the soul. Rather, there's oneness and unity. But here he says, not obey, but submit. The word submit means to support, to follow, and to show honor. To show honor, to respect, to follow, and to support. And it's really important to understand what the Bible says about submission. Because biblical submission is positive and not negative. We sometimes hear the word submit or submission and we think of it in a negative context. But biblically speaking... Submission is a positive thing. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, we, we read about how Jesus submitted to the Father. We, we see that very clearly in the garden when Jesus submits to the will of the Father. It says, not my will, but yours. That submission is a positive, not a negative. In fact, one of the things that we sometimes think is that to submit or to support is to actually lose honor. It is to give away honor. It is to have your honor taken from you. But biblically speaking, submission is not about losing honor. It's about giving it. It's about showing honor, which does not reflect upon you, and it does not strip you of any dignity or any value or any worth, and it does not make you less than. It's simply about showing honor. In fact, In verse 21 of Ephesians chapter 5, right before the Apostle Paul talks about marriage, husbands and wives, in verse 21 he says that we the church are to submit to one another in reverence to Christ. Now we know throughout Scripture, and the Apostle Paul talks about the church many, many, many times, and he says that the church is a body made up of many members with different functions, with different gifts, with different roles, and with different responsibilities. But he says here in Ephesians, that church, you are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That submission is not a negative, it's a positive. It's about showing honor and support to one another. But here he wants to distinguish what that looks like in a marriage because a marriage is unique. And the submission that a wife shows to her husband is unique. It does not mean, ladies, that you are to submit to every man. He's very specific. He says wives are to submit, to show honor and support, to follow their husbands, not any man. In fact, that word is very interesting. The word in Greek is hupotasso which is a combination of two words, hupo and tasso. And the word tasso in Greek is a military term. It's a military term which means to set and arrange and support in such a way as to deploy one for battle. It is about support and arranging and setting things in such a way that somebody else is able to, go sus- to be sustained and prepared to fight a battle. It is to deploy someone well for battle. So what is the Apostle Paul saying here? He's saying, wives, 
When you show honor to your husband, when you respect your husband, when you support your husband, when you seek to follow his leadership, as he'll speak about in a moment, you are deploying him for battle. You are setting and arranging things so that he might go fight on the front lines of your marriage the adversity and the battles that you may face well, that he might be sustained to fight. Because he is going to say that husbands, as he mentions here, I think in verse 23, that the husband is the head of the wife. The husband is called to lead, and we're going to flesh out what that means. That the husband is to lead in fighting the battles to fight the battles that are affecting your marriage, the things that are happening in your life and around you, to seek to protect the sanctity of your marriage. And that, wives, you are to submit to your husband to show honor, respect, and support so that you might deploy him to fight well, to be sustained. And then he says here this too, that actually your submission is an act of worship. He says, you submit, you show honor to your husband as to the Lord. That is an act of worship for you to submit so that you might deploy him to fight well as the head, as the one who has been entrusted to lead and to protect your marriage and your family. And this analogy that he gets into in verse 24 is very interesting because as he's said this, as he said, Husbands or wives submit to your husbands for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He says in verse 24, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. We see this in scripture that there's this interesting analogy between marriage and Christ and the church. That a marriage is analogous to Christ and the church. That right here he spells it out. Just like the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands. He's going to continue that where he says, just as Christ loves the church, so also husbands are to love their wives. Now there's a lot of implications to this analogy. But here's what I want us to consider today. Consider Christ as the head of the church, as the one who went to battle for us. You see, Christ went on the front lines to battle for us. And what did he battle? Our greatest enemy, sin and death. And he battled it on the cross. And then he came forth alive from the dead after three days, declaring victory in that battle against our eternal enemy, which is sin and death, and he paid for it, and he conquered it. And as a response of faith, when you come to faith in Jesus as your Savior, and you see him as the warrior who fought that enemy of sin and death for you on the cross, and was victorious, proved in the resurrection, what is your natural response? To submit to Christ. That is the natural response of the church, is to submit to Christ, to show honor, and to show respect, and to support the vision that Jesus has for our life, not our vision, and to follow him where he would lead us because he went to battle for us. And this is the connection, the analogy that the Apostle Paul is teasing out for us in the marriage. The husband and wife, there's a connection there between Christ and the church. And here's what's interesting about that. For us as the church, we submit to Christ because he went to battle for us. So therefore, our submission is responsive. We respond by submitting because Christ went to battle for us. And why do we submit? Because he showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, he died for us. He went to battle sin and death for us while we were still sinners. And so therefore, our natural response upon faith is to submit. Submission is responsive. So listen, wives. 
why do you submit to your husbands? The answer should be, because my husband has shown love to me. He has shown me love. It's a response. That's what the Apostle Paul says in verse 25. Right after he talks to the wives, now he directs his attention to the husbands. Verse 25, he says this, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. He's keeping that analogy. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. You see, listen, husbands, your love for your wife is what kickstarts the wheel of your marriage. It is what builds the momentum, is your love toward your wife. In fact, it makes perfect sense because you have been called to be the head, to lead. But how do you lead? You lead with love. And it is so vital to get this. In fact, the Apostle Paul understands how vital it is. That's why he spends twice as much time speaking to the husbands as he does to the wives. He wants the men to get this. To understand their responsibility. That they're to love their wife. So what does it mean then? Husbands, what does it mean for you to love your wife? Well, he makes it pretty clear. It's very plain. He says, love your wife just like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So how do you love your wife? Through sacrifice. Love is self-sacrificing. Husbands love their wives by sacrificing their own interest for the interest of their wife. Husbands are willing to go to battle for their marriage and for their wife, even if it's going to cost them, because that is what love is. It is self-sacrificing. If the Apostle Paul was kind of going with the times, he would have said the exact opposite. But remember, he's combating what Plutarch, the Greek philosopher, said and what was the widely held belief. The widely held belief is that the wife obeys. She's the one that submits to the husband's leadership and the husband leads, not with love, but with power, with authority, because he is the soul of humanity. He is the intellectual, rational one. Therefore, he is the one to have the seat of power and authority. In fact, that's what Aristotle says too, which also would have been a widely held belief. Aristotle said that if you are a leader, if you are a ruler, you should feel no expectation to love those that you're leading. The Apostle Paul says the exact opposite. He is turning social conventions upside down. Husbands, you don't lead from a place of authority or superiority or by trying to hoard some sense of power. No, you lead with love. So I love what the Apostle Paul is doing here in this passage. He's changing everything, what people assumed how marriages are meant to function and had been functioning for a long time. He's showing the beauty of wives that can submit to their husbands to deploy them into battle to support them and respect them. And then he's saying, husbands, listen, you want to know how you love your wife? How you actually build momentum to get that wheel moving in your marriage? You love your wife by being willing to sacrifice of yourself for her and for your marriage. He's turning everything upside down. In fact, he's, he's turning masculinity itself upside down. Because during this time, the culture would have said, to be masculine is to be superior, is to have power, and is to claim and hold on to authority. That is why when Christ goes to the cross, it is not seen as masculine at all. It is seen as shame. That's why he endured the shame of the cross, hung naked, lost all of his power, lost all control, lost all what people viewed as authority, nobody would have looked at the cross and said, that's a picture, of, a picture of masculinity. But it is in fact the greatest picture of masculinity. It is in fact the greatest picture of masculinity because you see love and power accurately 
power is given away, but it's actually maintained in a very unique and special way through love. He's flipping everything upside down. That the way that we lead is actually through love. That true power is founded in real love for those that you are responsible for. True power is founded in real love for those that you are responsible for. The Apostle Paul is saying, husbands, your wives have been entrusted to you. You're to lead them. But do you know how you lead? With love. And that is in fact true power. To lead with love. A self-sacrificing love. It's not ambiguous what it looks like to love your wives. You sacrifice. That is true power. And sadly, and I have to say this, sadly I think, that in many ways we still have lost this understanding of true power. We've lost what it means to lead with love. We've fallen prey to believing that masculinity is superiority. Because oftentimes men that lead their wives by loving them and sacrificing for them are often the recipients of shame by other men, oftentimes in the form of jokes. And men, you know what I'm talking about. You know how that is. Jokes about you sacrificing of your own interests for the interests of your wife and your marriage. But see, you should feel no shame. And you certainly, certainly should Never seek to cast shame on any, any man that is leading his wife by sacrificing of his own interests and of his own self for the sake of his wife and his marriage because that is in fact what we've been called to do. To lead with love. And it's not an ambiguous love. It's not sentimental. Though certainly there is a sentimental aspect of our love for our wives. We're to lead with sacrifice. Type of love that Christ has shown us. That is how we lead. The Apostle Paul continues. Remember I told you he spends way more time speaking to the men. He says in verse 28 through 30 this, In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. He's saying here this, Christ nourishes and cherishes the church. It's another way that he loves the church. So husbands, you lead your wife by loving her, by sacrificing for her, and you should seek to nourish and cherish your marriage and your wife. You may be thinking, well, how do I do that? How do I nourish my marriage? How do I cherish my wife? There's, I, mean, I think there's many ways, but here's one way that I want to encourage you today. And that is this. Ask your wife how you might love her better. Ask your wife if you are fighting the battles that need to be fought for your marriage. Ask your wife if you're leading her well. Ask your wife if she's feeling cherished by you. Now, you may be thinking, I don't want to go there. Like, that's going to be a hard conversation. I'm nervous about, like, how, like that, that could be a multiple day. That could be a weeks-long conversation. I could hear some really hard things. Yes. But it's good. That's how you nourish and cherish your marriage, is that you are asking for the support of your wife to help you be deployed for battle. To battle for your marriage. And so you are asking for her to help set and arrange so that you might lead well. And wives, as you're being asked by your husbands to share, you need to share with honor. You see, that's the thing. We 
do not, as husbands, we do not always fight the battles we are meant to fight. We do not always love perfectly. We are not like Christ, who fought the battle for us perfectly and loves us perfectly and nourishes and cherishes us, his church, perfectly. We don't do that. And so we need to ask husbands, our wives, to receive that support. And wives, when you share, you're to share with honor so that you might move the wheel of your marriage forward and build momentum. And here's, one, here's a little test. If you're unable to have those conversations, you're unable to ask or you're unable to share with honor and respect, there's a very clear place to begin to work on your marriage because you need to begin to have those conversations to begin to nourish your marriage. Husbands need to learn and hear of places that they can love better where they can go fight battles that they maybe don't see. And wives, you need to feel free to share, but also to share with honor, to support in the way the husband needs. So husbands, ask your wife how you might cherish and nourish and lead better in your marriage. And wives, share with your husbands, but share with honor, supporting The Apostle Paul, in closing in verse 31 and then in 33, he says this, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one. Again, you see very clearly how he's combating Plutarch here as he's giving these different roles and responsibilities that are very different what everybody would have held to and believed and thought was good and wise. He says, actually, there's these unique roles of a wife as a husband, and you come together in one flesh, this is God's design that you leave your father and mother and you come together. And that as you become one, not one as the soul and one as the body, but one together mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, you begin to experience the beauty of God's design in marriage the joy that is found in marriage, the momentum that can be built up in marriage when you function in these ways. Here's a side note. We'll talk about this a little bit next week when we look at singleness. But this is why it is so important to marry someone that that you are equally yoked with, meaning somebody that has the same faith in Christ as you. Because you cannot experience oneness if you are not one holistically. You, you cannot just be one mentally, emotionally, and physically, but not spiritually. you got to be one spiritually. In fact, it's the most important component. So that you can experience all that God has set for marriage, which is not a social construct, and is not just a survival tactic to combat loneliness. You can be lonely in a marriage. But you need to seek to be one so that you can receive this challenge from God's word as a man or as a woman. And I think that if we see this, and we begin to live like this, we'll see that wheel begin to turn. And that momentum begin to build up, not just as one side turns, but as both turn together to build up speed. That's why the Apostle Paul closes very just wraps it all up in verse 33 where he says, however, let each one of you, speaking to the husbands, love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. He uses, instead of submit, he uses respect. Show honor, show respect, support. Now listen, you may be hearing this and thinking a lot of things. You may be thinking about the ways that you've been failing as a wife or as a husband. You may be thinking about how your vision for marriage was way different that future marriage you're hoping for. Maybe it was different than what you see here. Maybe you're thinking about a previous failed marriage and you're feeling a weight. You're feeling shame or guilt. I want to say this. As you start this week anew and afresh, and that's my prayer for you, that you're challenged but you start fresh, that you realize something, that you cannot fulfill the role of husband and wife, as we see here, unless you are resting as a bride. You have to rest as a bride. Because 
when you rest as a bride of Christ, Christ as the bridegroom, the head, the one who leads, the one who fought the battle for us of sin and death on the cross and was victorious, the one who invites us through faith into his victory, the one who cherishes us and nourishes us, what you realize is that you are forgiven and free. When you rest in your reality as a bride of Christ and him as the perfect bridegroom that loves well and loves perfectly and can sustain you, you are reminded that you are forgiven and free. So you may be thinking about all the ways that you failed in your marriage. You're forgiven and free. You may be thinking about the mistakes that you've, you've made in dating relationships. You may be thinking about how you had a faulty view of marriage. You may be thinking about a previous failed marriage. And feeling like you, you interacted with your husband or your wife in the wrong way. You're forgiven and free as a bride of Christ. You are forgiven and you are free. And that should take you to move forward this week, to move forward with joy, to move forward with anticipation, to say, God, I, I, I want to experience that freedom as a bride of Christ. As I consider the way that I may be a husband or a wife this week, or as I reflect on a previous marriage, or as I anticipate a future marriage that I'm praying for you to bring, knowing that you're a God that brings it in the perfect timing, and right now you may be cultivating my heart, that you would rest in the reality that you're forgiven and free. I want to close with this quote. I love this quote from Martin Luther, the pastor and reformer. He says this, and I hope that this resonates with you this week. He says, who can understand the riches of the glory of this grace? Here this rich and divine bridegroom Christ marries this poor wicked harlot, redeems her from all her evil and adorns her with all his goodness. Her sins cannot destroy her since they are laid upon Christ and swallowed up by him. And she has that righteousness in Christ, her husband, of which she may boast as of her own, in which she can confidently display alongside her sins in the face of death and hell and say, if I have sinned, yet my Christ, in whom I believe, has not sinned. And all his is mine, and all mine is his. As the bride in the Song of Solomon says, my beloved is mine, and I am his. I pray this week, church, that you would remember that you are a bride of Christ, forgiven and free, that you go forward with anticipation, with joy, feeling forgiven of anything in the past and being hopeful of the future. Will you pray with me? God, we are grateful that you are patient with us, that you give us a picture of, of the responsibilities within marriage, that we see that it is your set design, that you have ordered it for us, for our flourishing. I pray that you would challenge us, Holy Spirit, that you would move in us to give us a picture, a very clear picture for those of us that are married of how we might interact and how we might lead, or support, that you would begin to move the wheel of our marriage forward with momentum. For those of us that have previous marriages that may have failed, would you give us freedom from that? Would you remove that shame? Help us to rest as a bride of Christ. Be hopeful for what lies ahead. As well as for those that are anticipating a future marriage, would you speak right now that your timing is perfect, that you're cultivating and preparing their heart for what you will do because you are a God that always works good. We pray that this would be our reality this week and would sink in deep today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.